Ladies and gentlemen, you join me for a historic moment. This is Atari A to Z, and we have finally reached Z for the first time. Which is uh, not something I knew that I'd actually be able to do when I started this project, but, well, we've seen it through so far. This is the last of our first cycle of Atari A to Z. Uh, from next time, we'll be going back to A, and we'll be starting all over again. So, for our Z game, I've chosen Zeppelin by William Mataga. Or Mataga, not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, this was published by Synapse Software, who uh, will become quite a familiar site on this series over time. We've already seen a few games by them. Um, William Mataga was, I believe, the creator of the game Seamus, which we'll probably come to at some point on this series, uh, which is a very good game. This is also a good game, uh, but not one that gets talked about as much as Seamus does. Um, I was looking up some information on this before I started recording here, and uh, this game cost $34.95 when it was first released. I don't know if that was standard practice for Synapse software at the time, but um, yeah, that seems like an awful lot of money for a video game but i guess uh <laughs> i guess when you grow up with games on cassette that cost two pound 99 from companies like mastertronic and so on uh, you get a bit spoiled but uh yeah obviously we don't bulk at paying 34.95 or more for a game these days but it's uh, just surprising to see a game from from this era which uh was sort of early 80s i forget the exact date i think 1983 or something um yeah, just unusual to see a game from that era costing that much money. Okay, let's begin. If I can find the start button. No, that's the reset button. There we go. Entering level 7. Um, Yes, I remember from when I originally played this game not really understanding why you start at level 7. But, well, that's what you do. Oops. Uh, and this is a shoot 'em up. So it's forced scrolling. But there are a few interesting little touches in there, like this destructible scenery. Uh, the ability to pick up objects, like this key that I've got here. And the ability to just shoot in different directions. And even that sort of uh, restarting immediately where you left off is quite an unusual thing to see. There's more often than not in games at a time, if you uh, if you got destroyed in a game like this, you tend to have to go back to uh, back to the start of the level or back to a checkpoint at the very least. But from here, you can just you can just carry right on. Uh, help. Ah, there we go. So I believe what's going on with this is that there's um, sort of multiple reach through the levels. And I guess which direction you take at some of those junction points there determines which direction the screen's going to scroll from that point on. Haven't quite worked it out yet, but... Uh, And there's all sorts of different things to pick up along the way. And lots of things to blow up. Okay, well... That was a good start. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a look at the manual before we continue any further. Okay, so... It, it is pretty much as it appears. Um... So the keys, you are looking for keyholes to use those on, and that will open up certain routes. Uh, the things that look like hamburgers, they, they, they actually are hamburgers. Uh, and those are there to be fed to the hamburger monster. And then aside from that, all you're really trying to do is just blow everything up. So there you have it. And different things are worth different amounts of points. So, for example, buildings are worth 20 points. Certain things are worth other amounts of points. And then there's these interesting hazards going on as well. So we're in the middle of an earthquake at the minute. And that's causing debris to fall from the ceiling. I think you can, yes, you can shoot that debris. 
But these falling rocks that fall in those patterns, you can't destroy those. So you've just got to dodge through those as quickly as you can. There we go. Extra life. Very nice. And so this game was actually bringing quite a lot of interesting things to the table for when you consider that it came out in 1983. So we've got multi-directional scrolling, uh, which was quite in unusual at the time. And so we've already seen games like Vanguard on this series. Oh, that's a hamburger monster there, so we need a hamburger to get rid of that. But I do not have a hamburger, so... Oh, it doesn't force you into dying. That's good. See, I can think of plenty of games there that would have just scrolled you into death at that point if you, because you didn't have the thing that you needed in order to progress. But this, no, it's actually sending you back up through the level until you can find what it is that you're looking for. And so there's actually quite an interesting sort of almost an action-adventure element to this. In that, yes, it is, it is forced scrolling. Um... But because there are different routes you can take around the levels. Oh, that was unpleasant. So that, if you couldn't work out, is a switch. I appear to be stuck in a wall now. Oh dear, it crashed the emulator. <laughs> let's um, let's start again. That playthrough is going really well as well. All right, so. So yeah, so a significant part of this game is going to be actually learning the map. And because of the way the game is constructed, it's quite a different sort of thing that you have to learn from... Can we not pick that when we got a key? Apparently not. Yeah, it's quite different from learning a standard shoot 'em up layout because you've got all these alternative routes that you can go. You've got... Um, Switches that you can press. Like that one there. All these interesting hazards to contend with. So yeah, like I say, I do remember playing this game back in the day, but not really sort of getting it or necessarily having a full understanding of it. Coming, to, this is one of those games that, coming to it from a modern perspective, it's it's really interesting. Ooh, loads of extra lives on that one. So, oh, that looks unpleasant down below, doesn't it? Ah, but we found a way to get rid of those rocks. That's good. So yeah, this is a super cool game, actually. I. As I say, I remember enjoying it a lot, just as a, a sort of simple shoot 'em up when I was a kid. But now, considering the sort of actual depth of mechanics and structure that we've got here, yeah, I'm into it. I'm very much into it. And just things like the. The fact that your default firing direction changes according to which direction the screen's scrolling, that's really good. So, like, if I just press the fire button by itself now, we'll shoot ahead of us like that. If we're going up the screen, it will shoot up by default. So, it means that when you're in a situation where you're going up the screen like this, it just means that you're not... Um, you're not sort of forced into pressing awkward directions on the joystick to, in order to progress. Right, so I've got this hamburger now. So let's see if we can get back to the hamburger monster. And give him what he wants. Lives! Yes, please. So he was down here, I think, if I remember rightly. Right, 
yeah, so these switches do things like they make walls disappear or they turn off those um, falling rock patterns and that sort of thing. Yeah, here he is. He's down here, isn't he? So if we give this to him, there we go. Um, num, 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 num. And he turns into a switch that can open up that wall. That's good. So we can then proceed further down here. This is exciting. This is the furthest I've ever got in this game. Oh, and that's... So you need the TNT for that bit, which we saw a little way back. So it's going to send us back up again. And so now we need to go and collect the TNT. Yeah, this is a really unusual, interesting game. That I don't think I gave enough credit to as a child, but... Uh, I mean, obviously back at that time I didn't really know a great deal about different types of game design and game structure, so. Well, there you go. At least I can appreciate it now. Back through the earthquake again. Whoa. Many, many earthquake blocks. Which way now? It was down here, I think, wasn't it? I think stuff is respawning when we come back through an area as well, so you get to shoot it again. I think. It certainly looks that way. It would make sense as well, because if you're if you're sort of going back and revisiting areas, it would uh, it would be quite boring if it just uh, everything stayed dead. So, I think there was some TNT. No, where was that? Oh no, it was down, wasn't it? Down this way. Yes, because I remember going around that corner. And then what, down here? Yes, there it is. Right, so we now got the TNT, so we need to find a means of turning round. So, can we just go up and around, maybe? Up and around to the left. That would seem to make the most sense. Another thing we can do. Definitely don't want to go to the right there. That looks like death. Uh, through here? Let's go this way. Oh, this might have been a mistake. Oh, definite mistake. You do seem to have a brief period of invincibility uh, when you take damage as well. That's, uh, again, relatively unusual for the era, certainly in home computer games. I know it's a very common thing that you see from sort of the 16-bit era onwards, definitely. But, uh, yeah, it's actually quite unusual to see a game where you have the opportunity to actually get yourself out of danger when you take damage. Yeah, everything's definitely respawning when we come back through the area, isn't it? Oh, extra life for 10,000 points. Right, so back down this way again. Does mean that we get to get all the points from blowing up the buildings again. Oh, no. Passed by the satisfied burger monster. Fun fact, this game... Oh, no! I blew myself up. Oh, I see. Right. So you start at level 7 and you work your way up rather than down. So presumably level one is then the last level. 
or maybe level zero. I don't know. One or the other. Anyway, it's going slightly faster now. This does look like familiar scenery, though, because I remember seeing that before. Some more lives. Lovely. More earthquakes going on. I don't know where we're going this time. But I'm sure we'll figure it out. So I guess the aim in each level is to put the TNT in place and blow it up from the look of things. Because uh, I believe what I saw it from in the manual was that you're uh, you're infiltrating the base of some evil organization with a stupid name that began with Z. Because early 80s video game storyline. And therefore it would make sense for you to sort of be sabotaging their bases. Because these are presumably supposed to be their secret bases that you're exploring in your Zeppelin. Which doesn't seem like a terribly practical... Right, so TNT needs to go here this time. Yeah, Zeppelin is, would probably not be my first choice for a stealthy infiltration of an enemy base. But, you know, well... That's what we've got, so that's what we're going to deal with. I mentioned in the last video on Yoop that the um, Atari's chip that handled sound, among other things, the Pokey chip, had some quite distinctive sounds that could be created using the, uh, the built-in parameters you could pass to the sound commands. And this game is a pretty good example of some of those commands. So, for example, that um, the Zeppelin engine sound we've got in the background for one is a very common sound that you'll hear in Atari games. That earthquake sound as well is also very commonly used for um, explosions and earthquakes and that sort of thing. If you watch the video on the, uh, the last Starfighter game, you'll recognise that because it was used for all of the explosions in that game. Okay, so... Don't know where we're going. We seem to just be going back towards the start of the level. Let's go down this way. I don't think we've been down this way. Down, please. Yep. It looks as if... Um, rather than each level being completely handcrafted in this, I guess... Uh, each one has been sort of built from building blocks, I guess. So some sort of pre... There's the TNT. Lovely. Yeah, so it's been built from predefined building blocks. And then maybe arranged in a different combination. Which again, is quite a common means of uh, building larger games in this era. A really good example of this um, is uh, River Raid by Carol Shaw, which is uh, a very early, very, very good vertically scrolling shoot 'em up that is one of my favourite games of all time, without a doubt. And uh, the way that worked is the, the game is actually procedurally generated, uh, but not in a random way. It's set up with a fixed seed so that it it generates the same levels every time. But that means that you'll see uh, sort of familiar structures and, and that sort of thing because they're... I guess it's not quite the same thing as this. It's, no, it's, it's not quite sort of predefined building blocks and then put in together. But it is... It is using means to start from... Using means to uh, create a fixed level design without having to necessarily handcraft the whole thing. Which is actually something that developers are st still very much do today. If you think of today's massive open world games, a significant amount of those will be the result of procedural generation. Just for them to do things like generate the, the basic terrain for an area and then maybe slap some buildings and NPCs and stuff on top of it.
And I believe um, stuff like No Man's Sky. Oh no! We're going to die. Are we going to die before we drop the TNT? Yeah, as I was saying, stuff like No Man's Sky was, uh, they made quite a big deal of being procedurally generated when, uh, that's what they meant. It didn't mean randomly generated and different every time. It means that the the whole game had been produced in such a way that it made use of um, sort of these building blocks and put together and generated in advance rather than completely handcrafted because it, in something on the scale of No Man's Sky, there's no way that even a large team of people would have been able to put that together all in one game. But anyway, I think that's probably a good place to stop there, because that was that was an excellent playthrough. That's the furthest I've ever got in that game, and that's very satisfying indeed. So, that was Zeppelin by William Mataga. That is the end of our first cycle of Atari A to Z. We'll be back next time with another A, and then we'll go round all over again. Very exciting. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects moegamer.net where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today and videopackgames.wordpress.com which aims to catalogue the small but well-formed library of the Philips G7000 video pack computer also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Thank you.